Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only had to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. This episode is brought to you by Experian. Are you paying for subscriptions you don't use but can't find the time or energy to cancel them? Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. On this 85th episode of the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast, I'm going to talk about a 20-inch trout and some of the lessons that I learned from it. So 20 inches, especially for trout, especially for trout in the East Coast, that's kind of like a, a number that you know we, we look at and say, yeah, it's a big fish. And there's certainly something to be said for a 20-inch fish, but again, it's just a number. There is a very distinct sound that accompanies the rise of a big trout. Have you noticed this? Most seasoned fly fishers know that big fish don't seem to splash when they're feeding. You know, one might think that big fish make big noises, but that's not always the case. You know, the movement that produces surface splashing requires energy. Furthermore, it requires an amount of energy that can't easily be recouped by consuming tiny insects. Big trout will splash for a mouse or for a bait fish, but they usually won't splash for a mayfly. When there's an abundance of mayfly spinners that are present, a lot of fish take advantage of the situation, of course. This is all those hatches that we all uh, want to pursue and want to get after. Because the bugs, hapless and spent, the lifeless little guys are easy meals. Consequently, there are splashes and sips, the sounds of small and medium-sized trout all over the place. However, big trout gulp. They gulp. The feeding sound of a 20 inch plus fish eating mayflies is unique. Now, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but oftentimes this is what happens. Now, the first thing you notice is there's not a lot of urgency in the noise because they're silently thinning in the current. They're just inches below the surface. And a trout like this doesn't have to worry about other fish butting in to claim their lane. A lot of small fish have this nervous energy when they're feeding off dries. They're not wanting to be so close to the surface that they can get picked off by a bird or something like that, but they're also just in this constant shoving match with each other when there's multiple fish in a pool. So the big fish, with the slightest tilt of their head, they drift upwards in the water column and open their mouths. So what happens is you have a pocket of water that gets displaced. Then that surface tension, with the bug probably dead center, it's broken across a plane the size of like a playing card, and that's the inside of that trout's mouth. And all that mass gulps down into the mouth of the trout. And that's where you get this gulping sound. And then, of course, the water goes through the gills, the bug gets eaten, and the fish repeats the relatively effortless process over and over and over again, making up its caloric needs for that evening. So I'd been fishing a particular spinner fall for the better part of a week. And as I've been doing so, I'd been hearing a gulp a few times over the previous nights. The stream I was fishing is a Pennsylvania freestone stream, but it has significant spring influences. That being said, it's nice and chilly in the middle of the summertime. It's the kind of thing the fish are always on and always active, almost 12 months out of the year. But because of that, it gets fished hard under even normal circumstances. So during a hatch, and a hatch you could set your watch to, it was crowded to the point of deterrence. And I would have been deterred, except for the fact that the fishing was phenomenal. Now, one quick aside. It's really hard to, in my mind, justify not fishing a crowded stream when it's dark. If there's enough fish in one spot where I don't have to be bothered by other people. Does that make sense? I go in one spot, and I camp out, and there's fish everywhere, and there's nobody for 20 yards above me or below me. And if there's somebody 20 yards 
ahead of me to maybe 20 yards and one inch, I'm not going to be able to see them. I'm not going to be able to hear them. And it's not going to be a problem. So just knowing there's somebody there, it could be problematic, but it's not enough again to deter me to fish. It was one step below combat fishing, I guess. And best practices demanded showing up to a spot around six o'clock to ensure that your preferred casting position come go time at eight o'clock was available. So for the first three nights, I'd been exactly where I wanted to be. So from river left, I had access to an end of a run at the two o'clock position, a small pool directly in front of me, and some faster water after that, which led to a sharp streamwide riffle to my left. So within a 15 or 20 foot cast, I could cover 180 degrees of diverse water with my back up against the, the riparian bushes. And for three nights, I didn't move and I caught a lot of rising trout. And they were different fish. They, they looked different. I wasn't catching the same fish over and over again. But most of these fish were in the 8 to 14 inch range. Nothing to sniff out in the stream. But I kept hearing that distinctive gulp. It was coming from my left. It was so audible, so loud. It felt like it was right there. And of course, noise travels great over water. It seems to travel even greater when it's dark out and your your hearing seems to be compensating for, for your eyesight not doing as much much work. And I assumed it was right below me. I thought it odd that a big fish would be feeding on spinners just above faster water. So the, the there would be a drop off. And so it just didn't make sense that a big fish would be fighting that current where although it looked glassy, I know that there's this steep drop and a lot of pull and so that fish would be really having to push a lot of uh of effort into staying in that spot to to feed like i'd been talking about i thought i was unable to make a good presentation from an upstream position that you know that that fly drifting down was dragging or i just wasn't getting in that right lane and and a stream with so much variation even in that spot some of those currents were hard to make out even during full light but when it was dark it made it even more difficult so every night I'd hear the sound and every night I would slowly move downstream after I heard that fish begin to feed, but I could not locate the source of the sound. No big fish, no, no misses on big fish, no slurps and gulps and me pulling the fly out of that spot. It just wasn't happening. So the fourth night I brought someone who wanted to learn how to fly fish. So I talked up the foolproof nature of the spinner fall. I walked him to the spot that I'd been fishing earlier in the week. Now, I had planned to fish just upstream so that we'd both be in the same stretch. I could fish the run kind of properly, and he could fish um, that, that riffled water in the pool. Now, as we popped out of the woods, I was glad to see that his spot was open. However, there was someone upstream where I had planned to be. There was a dispensation of decorum and, uh, and grace that came over me. Because for the purposes of a good testimony and, and, and seeming like a, a sane person before a brand new angler, I quickly opted to fish downstream instead of upstream without showing any external signs of frustration. So what this did is it put me below the short riffle and in the shallows. I mean, we're talking ankle to shin deep, significantly warmer, at least I perceived to be, because in this spot, there was no great tree cover uh, behind me. And so the water was warmed up a little bit more by the sun and the water coming down over those riffles was further across the stream. From what I I thought, it wasn't very fishy water, but I had to stay close to my guests to help with knots and flies and all of those things, unhooking fish and netting them and whatnot. Now, in this spot, I had caught a lot of fish in the daytime, in the early part of the day, when fish would be um, just uh, feeding on terrestrials. So as soon as that sun kind of hit the trees that were a little bit on the bank, this is a great spot for throwing beetles and ants and the like. But I wasn't optimistic about spinner falls and uh, bigger trout. So once the bugs did start to fall, the trout immediately began to feed, and any thoughts of being in a subpar spot dissipated as fish rose all around me. These are fish I had I had never heard the night before, fish I hadn't seen even in those in those twilight moments where you could really make out all the rise forms. I began to catch fish. I was catching some decent sized one, but then I heard it. The gulp was right in front of me. It was louder than I had heard the previous night. I didn't even think that was possible because it was so loud when I was upstream. But now I was hearing the full sound of this gulping trout because now the noise wasn't being muffled by the water rushing over a few feet of rock ledge. I also saw rippling waters moving in the fading light and all that data together matched with the sound that I'd heard and I cast upstream of where I thought the fish was. 
The gulp seemed to occur right when my fly should have been passing overhead. So I said the hook, and a fish was on, and it was heavy. Now, I think you're almost in a better position to catch a big fish when you're not thinking about it as a big fish, when you act instinctively and just kind of cast, and you hear the sound, and you set the hook. That's one of the nice things about night fishing, in my opinion, is that your senses are a little bit squirrely, and so I feel like there's a little bit of a delay. There's so much going on that it's it's almost a perfect storm, a perfect scenario where you kind of cast in an area where you think, and then you hear a sound, and you set the hook then, and you're not watching everything unfold. I feel like your ears are a little bit more honest in the pace that you should be casting and setting your hook than your eyes are, and... uh, I think that's something we should all should do is, is learn to fish more with our ears. But I back to my story. I was able to keep the trout in shallow water. And so combined with the fact that moving upstream wasn't ideal because of the, the rock ledges, the fish ended up in my net within a few minutes. It was a very, very quick fight, which sadly happens to 20-inch fish more often than not, in my opinion, especially on smaller streams. It was a fat, tan brown trout, and it had my spinner right in the front of its top jaw. It was just over 20 inches. It was like 20 and three quarters, if I remember exactly. Um, it was a, a big enough fish that I actually I, you know, marked it on my net and then went back and, and measured it. It was the largest trout that I'd ever taken in that stretch of the creek. I'd taken bigger fish upstream in some of the really deep uh, water, but in this spot that just got hammered by anglers that I'd been fishing with you know, 20 of my best friends for the previous three nights, I'd never taken something that big, period, let alone on this big hatch. So I slipped the fish out of my net and took a picture of him and he was sitting there in that shallow water. And uh, my friend came down and asked what the commotion was all about. And I had my headlamp on, so I wanted to shine it back at the spot where the trout had been, but it was nowhere to be found. The rises settled down and we were both ready to head out. He caught a couple of fish. He didn't catch a 20 inch fish. And I don't know if that makes me a bad host, but the reality was, is I put him in the spot I thought would be the best. And I ended up in the worst spot and, and I ended up with a a decent fish, but he was happy for me. I was happy that he got fish. He was happy that he got fish. I guess that's really all that matters. So I'm amazed at how I didn't do anything to put myself in a position to catch that fish except be inconvenienced. Despite my planning, a trout that I had misjudged and failed to approach properly numerous times was still caught. I was the beneficiary of a right place, right time scenario, and I effortlessly guided a very nice trout into my net. So he and I were breaking our rods down back on the bank, and I heard a familiar sound over our conversation. Further downstream than either of us had been standing, there was another gulp. Could it have been the same fish? Maybe. I mean, I've I've seen that before. You catch a fish so quickly, especially a bigger fish. You catch it so quickly, it doesn't really fight. It gets out there, and it starts to feed again. They're usually pretty hook shy, uh, but at the same time, there was a big fish feeding. Probably wasn't the same fish, but it was not of the realm of possibility. He asked me if I wanted to have a shot at it, and I, I did in one sense. But probably because of the contentment that I had from from uh, catching that other fish, or because it was late, or because he obviously didn't want to get back and out and fish, we uh, I, I declined the opportunity. So a benefit of fishing a lot is the ability to be a little choosy. So instead of splashing at every chance at a big fish, it allows us to have a more measured approach. With a lot of fly fishing comes an increased sample size to consider. There are more experiences, more insights more observations, but most importantly, it's a lot like the feeding habits of a big trout. You just be there, and opportunities will present themselves, and they require very little of you. So, 20-inch fish that I really didn't work for, that I really just found my way into, and it's a reminder that the more you fish, the more you have those chances. Are there times where you go fishing one time out of a year and you get into a fish like that? Absolutely. It happens all the time. It happens where I've never been to a stream before, and the first fish I see is this behemoth, and then I, after I fish it another half dozen times, I realize that that was the outlier, that that's not the normal circumstance. That's not the normal situation. But I find more often than not, the, the rule is the more fish you're in front of, the more chances you have at getting into that one fish, whether it's that one species that's different, or that one fish that's a little bit larger, or that one fish that wants to chase the kind of fly that you want to throw. You just fish more and more and more. Rarely do you you find that person who fishes a lot and doesn't catch anything. And the person that fishes, they see the most stuff. The most diverse angling circumstances 
are presented to you as you avail yourself to a wide variety of angling circumstances. So get out there and fish. Even if it's just for a few minutes, those observation skills really tick up as you hone them from fishing more and more. This week on castingacross.com, the first article is called Fly Fishing Books, Volume 8. So I have eight book review articles on casting across right now, and they go back five years of uh, the Casting Across library. This time I have four books, and what I, I usually do is I have, well, I always have four books, and one's a guide, one's a technical book, which has to do with like methods, locations, fly tying, and then one is literature, which is either like a novel, a biography, or a history book. And then I throw a fourth one in that kind of transcends a few of those categories or doesn't necessarily fit into one of those categories. So just for kicks, I'm going to go through those books real fast. The first one I've mentioned before on the podcast is called Fly Fishing Austin in Central Texas. Now, I was sent this book to, to review. This is not a book I sought out. And I actually told the um, publisher, you know, I don't plan on being in Texas anytime soon. They said, well, take a look at it. We see that you r- review and read these book kinds of books. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to say no to another fly fishing book. And I was really pleasantly surprised. Uh, like I said before, and uh, when I mentioned it on the podcast, it is neat to see a fly fishing guide that focuses primarily on warm water species. And it is written in a way that mirrors what we're used to with a lot of these trout guides. So the trout guides, you know, they talk about different regulations, the access points, the different species that you can find of trout in a a particular water, um, different stream features and things like that. But it has to do with a bunch of warm water species and warm water angling opportunities. It's just really well done. The photography is great. The information is awesome. It does, you know, adds cultural interest and dining options. And so it's a, it's a really, really fun book. And you do, and I've said this before, you really have to go very, very high level to compete with the information that's on the internet these days. And Fly Fishing Austin, Central Texas by Aaron Reed does that. Next book I talked about was The Fly Fishing the Flats by Barry and Kathy Beck. I cannot believe that this book is only 21 years old because I feel like it has been a classic for much longer. And even as I say that, I've, I, I'm i thinking there this might be a reprint or this might be a second edition or something like that, but my copy I bought the year it came out in 1999. This is before I'd ever fly fished in saltwater, and I still use it as a reference point. Uh, the photography and the diagrams, good diagrams, are worth their weight in, in gold. Um, but this book by Barry and Kathy Beck is just a great reference point for somebody who's just getting into fly fishing. The, the, a, a little bit of the information, particularly about the gear and equipment, is dated, but the rest of it is is timeless and classic. So Fly Fishing the Flats by Barry and Kathy Beck. Their book is Trout Madness by Robert Traver, a.k.a. John Volkner. So uh, this is another classic of fly fishing literature. Um, it's 21 stories. So if you are not a novel reader, then don't think of this as a novel. Think of it as 21 stories that have been arranged in such a fashion that it feels like you're reading a much larger story, but you don't have to read it that way. So if you don't have it, pick it up. Surprisingly enough, as popular as this book is, it was really hard um, for me to find a current printing of it. I mean, I I own two copies of it, but I was trying to find one to throw a link on there, and I couldn't find one, but I I guess I could have looked harder. Last book in this book review series is called 50 Places to Fly Fish Before You Die. This is that coffee table classic that I'll, I've, I've, I've seen and heard people put their nose up at it. And you know what? It's it's not the complete angler. It's not some it's not a John Gearock book. It's it's all it is is 50 advertisements for 50 awesome places that I would be more than happy to fish. And so it's a great little launching point. You read a page and a half snippet about some famous river or beach or lake and then you go do more data uh, mining for your own benefit if the moment strikes you but it's just a fun little book to have not that hard to find not that expensive and it's got nice pretty pictures so 50 places to fly fish before you die it's definitely worth having on your shelf or on your coffee table so definitely check out those reviews i go into a little bit more detail on that article and also there's the seven previous entries. I'm wanting to do more with fly fishing books, so stay tuned for Casting Across um, in the near future to see what uh, what I do with books. But then my Wednesday post, I really, I, I think you should check this one out. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it in, uh, in, in the sense that I did two things. I wrote an article and I did a video accompaniment. 
So the article is called Flyline Clean, Replace, or Upgrade, and the YouTube video that accompanies it is the same title, Flyline clean, replace, or upgrade. So I do a little experiment in which I have a dirty fly line and then I clean it. Then I use the same fly line, only the brand new version of it. And then I use a brand new premium upgraded fly line. And I kind of make a few comments at the differences between the uncleaned, the cleaned, the new, and then the upgrade and talk about why one or the other might be the wise choice. So I give a lot more information in the video, but Flyline is, as I write and as I say, it's the underappreciated member of the fly fishing gear trinity. Rods and reels get all the hype. And fly reels getting so much hype, especially for trout guys and girls, it's a little bit silly. I know there's lots of big fish that you have to play in your drag, but for most trout anglers, they're not using the drag. So save that money. You can get an awesome disc drag reel that can handle most trout you catch for $150, $200. Spend that money on Flyline. You'll be so much happier. You make so many more casts than you play fish on your drag. And it's a simple statement. It's an overgeneralization, but it's true. So in this article, I talk a little bit about, is it time to make the upgrade? You just need to clean it. Or maybe, maybe you could spend a little bit of money now if you find a fly line that you really like so that you have a replacement ready to go when there is a problem with your fly line breaking down. So this week's recommendation is actually a line that I've been casting for the last week. It's a brand new line from Rio. So I really like Rio products. I've been using their fly lines more in the last few years. I especially enjoy their Rio Creek uh, line. But I've been casting the Rio Perception and the Rio Gold in their elite line. So this is their their top end stuff. And both of these lines have their brand new technology called slick cast. And slick cast, you might say, okay, how can you make line slicker? How can you make it move through the guides faster? Well, they've figured it out. Um, now given I've been fishing it for a week and casting it for a week, how long does it hold up? Well, that's the second part of this slick cast technology is that it should be more abrasion resistant and it should be more uh, stable in diverse conditions and hold up to anything you can throw at it while you're angling. So in my mind, that is kind of the frontier for fly line technology. The tapers, you can only do so much. I mean, you, you can't get that much more wild in a taper and get it to do something that you really need your fly line to do. We, we kind of have it within the realm of, of what we're looking for in most casting circumstances, right? So getting quality materials and upgrading those coatings on the fly lines is is really what we should be looking for and really what we should be paying for. So I would encourage you, if you are a good caster, if you are able to get your line mostly where you want it to go, but you want a line that's going to perform excellently and it's also going to last for a long time, I would absolutely suggest you check out Rio's new line series with slick cast, especially in those elite models. They are going to cost a little bit more, but again, if you've spent 800 bucks on a fly rod or 600 bucks on a fly rod, then spending 20 or $30 more than a typical fly line for an excellent fly line is going to pay off dividends in your casting distance, accuracy, and the longevity of that fly line. There's a link to all that information on the bottom of this podcast on castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and the rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com where you'll find more info on this podcast and three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. Mm-hmm.